Hi, my name is Ruby Powers, board certified immigration attorney with Powers Law Group, and this is our weekly immigration news update. It is Friday, June 22nd, 2018, and what a week we've had of up and downs of news. Um, I'm really trying to digest it because I've been in about eight hours of community leader meetings and I know a lot, I just haven't had time to actually sit down and put it in writing. So this is going to be my attempt to letting you know what's going on and just give you my take on it. But uh, this last last week, the reason why we didn't do the, I didn't do a Facebook Live is because Michelle Strickland and I uh, were speaking at the American Immigration Lawyers Association Conference in San Francisco, California. Very beautiful, very cold at night. And um, so we had a really good time, but we, we met with a lot of 3,500 immigration attorneys from around the country and the world, actually, and were able to compare notes what was going on with major changes and talking about hot topics. So uh, I spoke about lawyer as manager, and she spoke on the topic of L1s. So we had a great experience, and we're glad to be back in the office. But also, yesterday, I had the opportunity and the honor to be speaking at the State Bar, which is still happening today, annual meeting, which is here in uh, Houston, and I was speaking on the hot topics with family immigration, because I'm on the Immigration and Nationality Act, uh, Nationality Immigration Section Board Council Member 5. Okay. So anyway, I was really glad to go to that and learn more um, as I attended the Immigration Committee to learn more about what's happening around the, the country and the state. So on to what's been going on. So let me just give a little background for a second. Um, about a month or so ago, uh, President Trump announced the zero tolerance policy about people entering the United States. And a lot of people who have been entering the United States are asylum seekers, people fleeing horrible situations, uh, past persecution, fear of future persecution from their home countries. And the law in the U.S. allows people to seek asylum, and they have within a year to apply, with some exceptions. So uh, a few weeks ago or so, he uh, the policy became to criminally prosecute people with Section 1325. You stay with me here. It doesn't get that too complicated, but this is the change. That immigrant, uh, criminally prosecute people who entered not at a port of entry. Now, a lot of people who were seeking asylum before a month or so ago would go to an, a not a port of entry. They would just go anywhere and they would go and look for border patrol and say, I'm seeking asylum. I'm not trying to flee you. I'm just trying to get help. And But this change happened recently under the zero tolerance policy. And what that meant was then these people were charged with a criminal charge and put through the criminal court. And then if they had children with them, the children couldn't be, could not be detained with the parents because the parents were considered criminals while the case was pending. Now, of course, this was a misdemeanor, illegal entry, and you're asking, well, why don't you go to a port of entry and ask for asylum? Well, because there's a long line of people trying to do it, and they might not be able to, to make it. There might not be enough. It might take a long time to be able to do that, and so people have been trying to do it this other way, which has worked in the past. So now when the person's charged criminally, they have to go to criminal court before they can be put on an ice hold, and then they get separated from the children. And then that's what's happened. About 2,500 children, I don't know what the youngest is, I've heard accounts of at least five years old, have been separated from their parents. And they were forcefully taken in very, we've heard different store accounts where the parents didn't know what was happening. And these children were, were, were placed somewhere else. And they were put under facilities, um, usually run by ORR, which helps the Office of Re uh, Refugee Resettlement that helps um, in situations like this. Now, the other thing you have to consider is the law states that a child is only allowed to be detained for 20 days under family separation, uh, sorry, in a family detention facility, a child was only allowed to be detained for 20 days. So if by splitting the families up, they weren't, the children was not in a family detention facility, then there was a possibility of detaining the child for a lot longer. 
So there's a lot of different aspects. It's hard to, I'm trying to dissect it for you, but the change is how they're criminally charging the entry then allows them to separate the children, which allows them to more, uh, more indefinitely detain the child. Now, I have been in literally about eight hours worth of talks with many community members all over the state and, and the country talking about what is happening, how can we help, what's the message. And there was a lot of public outcry. On Tuesday, I attended Mayor Turner's press release about, press conference about not wanting a tender age detention facility in downtown Houston which I later wrote an op-ed, which is in the Houston Business Journal today on Friday. So, but then on the next day, on June 20, I'm losing track of my time, I think June the 20th, President Trump extended an executive order to, uh, it's labeled affording Congress an opportunity to address family separation. But the idea was that he was going to stop family separation, which in fact, he created by having that zero tolerance policy. But in reality, this could be causing, put things in place to have fam indefinite family detention. And that's why this is, issue is not resolved. There's a lot of people going to vigils at the emancipation location where the, the, the tender age uh, or detention facility was is supposed to happen and it probably will still become a family detention facility from what I'm hearing. Uh, people are scheduling protests about this on next Saturday, July 30th, and there's a lot of activity going on still with the community. But this executive order, which he, let's just go over some parts of it. It orders immigration immigrant children seek a balance between he's seeking a balance between zero tolerance for families and ending the practice of separating children from their parents. But Trump, President Trump hasn't eliminated the problem by signing the order. Uh, he claim he claims that he, he's not encroaching on congressional authority because Congress already gave the president broad immigration powers under INA of nineteen sixty five. Then he defines the family alien family and alien child. What it does is the, e the executive order provision instructs Homeland Security to hold families that cross the border, but also includes important caveat to the extent permitted by law and subject to the availability of appropriations. It explains that uh, border agents can still separate children from parents in cases of suspected abuse or domestic violence. And under Flores v. Sessions, the administration may run into the 20 day limit under this law. The administration may either violate court order, re-separate the families, or release parents as with the children after 20 days. Modified catch and release that would under, undermine the zero tolerance policy. It doesn't say how it, or when it will work on reunifying the children that were separated. In fact, I spoke with local nonprofits yesterday and all of this week, and it's very chaotic. You'll see it in the headlines. The children were given an A number, which every immigrant is given, uh, in most cases, an A number, which is sort of like their social, social security number in a way, but for immigrants. And the only way that they're trying to figure, they have to be a detective for each child to figure out, maybe the mom or dad has an A number that was issued that's a number above or number below. And they have to call the 1-800 court number to figure out whether or not they can find that parent. A lot of times the parents' names were not given to them. And now we hear reports of parents putting their names and addresses and contact information on their children's clothing so that if they were to be separated, they'd be able to be found. I'm also hearing reports of children as young as five who a lot of them are speak indigenous languages from Guatemala and nobody knows the language. And there's this case of a story I heard directly recently that they don't know what language this child speaks and they're having a hard time communicating to be able to even try to attempt to reunify. We are also hearing reports that the CCA detention facility at Bush Airport will still remain open. I haven't heard that myself from the source, but I've heard it from someone who heard it from somebody. But I wouldn't be surprised because they're going to need a lot more detention facilities to keep people together. This doesn't have to happen. We don't have to have family detention. Beforehand, pregnant women, mothers with children, small children were held 
on their own reconnaissance. They were able to report. They had ankle bracelets. It didn't have to cost the federal government millions of dollars to detain people. The reason why they have the Flores v. Settlement case is because it's not ideal for a child to be held in detention. It's basically jail, that they should not be in jail. Children need to be able to play. They need to feel safe. They need to be able to go to school. And this is not the ideal environment. So I hope that summarizes the situation. I want to let you know that I'm still following this very, very closely, and I'm looking to see how my firm can donate time and work on some cases or help train people because there's still a lot that needs to be done. This is not over. So I'm uh, moving on to something that also that happened this week was that the immigration the immigration bill um, by Goodlot failed in on the House on Thursday. It was rejected, and um, it was um, it came a day the vote came a day after the President Trump signed executive order, and also I believe another vote was postponed um, and until later. And another thing that was we have really good news, yay, it was a Supreme Court case that was in favor of immigrants. Uh, it's the Padilla v. Sessions, and it came out, I think, yesterday, June, June 21st. Um, immigrants receive a near-unanimous victory from the Supreme Court Thursday morning, showing a case involving a Brazilian native who did receive a specific time and date. Who, I believe he did not receive a specific time and date showing up for removal. Um, the Supreme Court ruled in his favor because he originally came to the U.S. in 2000 and he overstayed, but he was never given exact date and time. And the bottom line is, is it says that to, to trigger the stop time rule, the government must serve a notice to appear that at least specifies the time and date of the removal hearing. So what does that mean? If somebody is given a, a notice to appear that says, to the time and date is to be determined in some time in the future and not a specific you must come this day and at this time then you can challenge whether that was a properly filed notice to appear and or whether or not it you could it might give the person more forms of relief for example if the person received the nta normally that's the stop that's why we call it the stop time rule it stops the clock and the person might not be el breaks it off eligibility for things like cancellation of removal and if that that happens they you know that can be some people's only really good form of relief so if the that nta was not properly filed and doesn't stop the clock then that person might be eligible for cancellation, for example. Bottom line, that was a really good decision for immigrants. If you are in removal proceedings, you should probably talk to your immigration attorney, or if you don't have one, get a call in with a consultation, because this can have a major impact on lots of cases. So this involves the if you were given a date and time on your first notice to appear, and any subsequent notice to appear because in many cases apprehensions at the border people were not given that date and time and they have a lot of in absentia orders which could give us a chance for a reopening of those cases so keep that in mind and just to let you know our number is 713-589-2085 and we also have an office in northern New Jersey which is 201-210-8240 you know, along with the detention, again, the other news was that um, that the U.S. prepares to house up to 20,000 immigrants on military bases in Texas and Arkansas. This would, um, you know, this is this is all evolving, like moment by moment. So we're still taking it in. And yesterday, Border Patrol, there was an article with the Washington Post that Border Patrol will stop re re referring immigrant parents who cross um, the U.S. illegally with children for prosecution. So if that's the case, then that could keep them from going to criminal court, which could then keep the families together. Um, basically, this this we're calling it a manufactured crisis was orchestrated piece by piece to cause this mass chaos that happened. And now I think they're they're trying to slowly dismantle it, 
but it still doesn't solve the 2,500 children who are, have maybe separated from their mom and dad for a month. And the, the case recently about the Guatemalan mom who sued the government because she was separated from her seven-year-old, they just got reunited recently and it had been a month since they hadn't seen each other. I mean, if you can imagine, if you have small children, the trauma that they're going through. And that's the other aspect. If you don't believe in what whatever your opinion is politically, if there's, it's the trauma to the child. That's really the heart-wrenching part about this whole situation. So we are um, going to, I'm presenting at the Houston section meeting on law practice management next Wednesday, and also we'll be going to New Jersey next weekend for a conference, uh, I mean, for go to the office in New Jersey and for consultations. Um, I think we've covered a lot of the material and to help give you a better understanding, but I just want to let you know that you can always plug into our newsletter. You can log on our website at rubypowerball.com and you can also give us a call. We also take questions. Today was a lot of news we wanted to cover and um, there's lots of different ways you can help. You, We've been posting a lot on our, our Facebook and a lot of our social media, whether it's from donating, a volunteering translation or time. Um, there's vigils and, and different protests and different communication ways to communicate. But, um, you know, I think that this should still be on the public public's attention, that it's not over and that we, we need a change. And the answer to family separation is not family detention. So please stay tuned with us. Thank you for listening. This is Ruby Powers with Powers Law Group. Thank you.